It is uh, wonderful to see you all here today. I'm Will Simpkins. I'm the Vice President of Student Affairs here at MSU Denver. I want to welcome you uh, to the university, to the Auraria campus, to the Cavia Theater. Um, it is great to see so many friends, colleagues, faculty, students um, here today for this really critically important conversation uh, for Colorado, for all of us. Um, I get two minutes, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about why MSU Denver is the perfect host for this conversation. Um, many of you may know over the last six years of Janine Davidson's uh, presidency and Steve Jordan before that, this university has focused on workforce development, supporting the career aspirations of Coloradans, and supporting the Colorado economy through higher education and through critically relevant uh, academic programs here at the university. But what you may not know is a couple of things about our work in immigration. Over 30 years ago, this university formed our Immigrant Services Program. It is two floors below us on the second floor, uh, if you want to stop by. Our incredible team supports thousands of students and their families navigating uh, Colorado navigating higher education, our work with community partners to form the UndocU Hub several years ago, making sure that there was one key place that families could call to receive information about uh, the services that they may need, um, has been uh, a, a jewel in our crown. Um, this is a place that has cared about the immigrant experience for decades. In 2006, 2007, the university intentionally, intentionally, pursued Hispanic serving institution status through the Federal Department of Education. That means we had to make 25% of our students identifying as Latinx or Hispanic and meet certain financial qualifications. Um, in 2019, we officially received that uh, designation, moving from 15% of our students in 2007 identifying as Latinx to now over 35% of our 17,000 students identifying as Latinx. That also means over 50% of our students are now students of color, and almost 60% of our students are in the first generation and their families to attend college. Next Friday at the Denver Coliseum, we will have the best day of the year commencement. And I got to tell you, sitting in the middle of the Coliseum, looking up at the stands, seeing families pouring through the doors, celebrating their students not just the 22-year-olds. Last year, we graduated a 71-year-old uh, through this work, is um, what it's all about. That is the moment, as the air horns are blowing, as the student is walking across the stage, that we all breathe a sigh of relief, because we did it. We got one more student across the stage. So we're excited to be here um, today to, to listen, to learn, to share some expertise. Thank you, Professor Padilla, for being here. Um, and I'll just end with this. What is so true is when the Colorado economy thrives, we know our communities will thrive. And when our communities thrive, all of our communities thrive, we know the Colorado economy will thrive. So thank you for being here. I am so excited to throw it over to Debbie Brown, who is an incredible ally to the university, and thanks for hosting this at MSU Denver. Thanks everyone for being here and thank you Will for the warm welcome. I told him this is our first event that we've had at MSU Denver and we're honored to be here on uh, such an important day and on such an important topic. Dr. Janine Davidson serves on our board of directors. Um, we've got a really unique business roundtable in that we don't just have market presidents and CEOs serving, we also invite university presidents, uh, CEOs of the nonprofit community in Colorado and also government partners. Uh, because we call it the ABCG, Academia Business Community Government. And we feel like that secret sauce is what helps come up with solutions and collaboration that's really powerful. I'll say one other thing, uh, probably attending MSU Denver's graduation ceremony for me last May was, uh, was one of my favorite days of the year because sometimes we work on the how so much in what we do, thinking about policy pillars and, and policy like immigration or tax and regulatory systems, you know, the, the how, and I forget the why. And seeing those faces, I was crying and then I was dancing and, you know, getting to chat with some of the students ahead of the, ahead of the big ceremony and seeing their families, uh, many of them first gen, many of them, as you said, uh, you know, Coloradans who are here who 
ha maybe this was their big opportunity. This was a really big opportunity and a big day for them and their, and their entire family it was very, very heartwarming. So that kind of brings us to the issue of why we're here today. But a little bit, uh, you know, there might be some of you who aren't familiar with Colorado Business Roundtable. I'll give you a quick update on, on what we're about. We're an affiliate of the National Business Roundtable based in Washington, D.C. Uh, so the National Roundtable is a coalition of CEOs from some of America's largest employers. And so we also serve a lot of those companies here that are um, large employers in the state. You can think about Deloitte, IBM, Boeing, for example. And we've also got some other companies that are a part of our um, organization that believe in our mission, which is that business is a force for good. Um, we believe um, having an economy, as you said, Will, that, uh, that provides a good business structure, a good business environment here, not only provides jobs and opportunity, pathways of new opportunity. Those graduates need a place uh, you know, to fulfill their dreams with a career that they choose. But our businesses here also provide tax revenue for critical services, uh, provides philanthropic support to all the charities that are doing such good work in our state. So that's our lens, is that business is a force for good. We've always worked on uh, immigration as an issue uh, since I've been a part of the round table about four years ago. And we feel like we can bring a critical lens sometimes that is missing in terms of private sector support for immigration as a workforce issue. Uh, I'll say for today, we've got a lot of really dynamic speakers and thought leaders here to, to give their perspective today. Um, we'll be covering lots of things. I, I was talking to Kit earlier. Uh, this issue is so complex. There's, we don't have time to cover every complexity. You'll hopefully meet some folks who can give you some additional um, information at a later time if there's something specific you want to talk about. But we're going to be trying to really focus in on how this issue could be, uh, how do we think about it in terms of workforce, that workforce lens. Um, one other quick aside, I was able to have uh, a briefing about a month ago with the former Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, if any of you are old enough to remember him. Um, some of you aren't, maybe. I mean, he's been gone a while. And he was always well known for sort of budget, you know, accounting, budget, you know, how do you forecast for uh, budget needs? And it was, this really, really struck me. Um, he, can't, he said, look, uh, to a kind of a small group of business people, he says, there's two things that will help America stay solvent financially, because that's always been his kind of thing. He says one is entitlement reform. No surprise. This is a Paul Ryan uh, brand. And he, and he spent a lot of time with us on sort of um, how do we save these entitlements for the future by some reforms. And then what struck me is he said the number two thing is immigration. We've got to be smart as a country on how we modernize our immigration system. And he had a lot of compelling um, thoughts on that. You can look at Japan and how they're they're looking at their migration system and their, um, you know, what will Japan be in 20 years because they don't have a, a talent opportunity. And then you can look at other countries like Canada who are being very strategic with sort of modern immigration systems and, and speedier paths to citizenship. Uh, and so it was an interesting uh, topic that came up. Um, what we'll hear from today, too, not only kind of the nuts and bolts about immigration, but the people side, the dignity of life, the dignity of work. Um, how do we understand that this is a people issue as well at the end of the day? And we don't want to get lost um, to not say that. So we've got um, a lot of great speakers to get to, um, but I am, we're honored as Colorado Business Roundtable to host the event today. We've got a lot of good partners in this space um, that we're happy to also check in with. Um, speaking of that, before I jump in, I want to thank Forward US for sponsoring our event today. If you're not familiar with them, we'll send out some additional information in a follow-up email. They provide a really critical data source for understanding um, how immigration trends are uh, perceived, um, how we're going to look at things like um, you know, the decline in rural America, how to understand how immigration could be a resource for that. And then recently, they published another report about um, technology jobs in the US semiconductor industry and the interesting interplay with how immigration would be uh, modernizing immigration system, particularly for tech talent, would be really critical. So we'll send out some of those resources as well, and we appreciate Forward US for the sponsorship today. So to kick us off, I want to uh, first, uh, I'm going to introduce two people that I think will be um, really great to help frame the conversation, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. 
And if anybody is still interested in a cup of coffee, you're welcome to bring it in the room. It just needs to have a lid because we are in a school, right, Will? <laughs> yeah, no, no, uh, no spilling. Um, but we were glad to get that uh, finalized. So our first speaker um, will be Dee Daniel Scriven. She is the director of the Office of New Americans, they call it ONA, and former Refugee Policy Council. She brings over a decade of experience from the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement with a diverse background encompassing roles as a prosecutor, public defender, and human rights advocate, Dee is a seasoned professional with a commitment to empowering and advocating for vulnerable communities. After Dee, we will hear from Atim Odi. How did I do, Atim? OT. OT, Atim OT, okay. I'm gonna get that right before the end of the day. Um, Atim is the Director of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the City of Denver. Uh, she spearheads immigrant integration efforts by educating city agencies and driving policy development for a more inclusive Denver. With a background as a practicing immigration attorney and former immigration legal services director, a team is a regional leader dedicated to supporting newcomers in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, before Dee comes up, let's give a round of applause to these two ladies who have very, very big jobs. <laughs> I told Debbie I would set my timer for 10 minutes because I am very passionate about the work I do and I could talk about it for a long time. But good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here with you today. Thank you to Cobert, to Debbie, and to Forward.us for sponsoring this event. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Today is actually my 18-month anniversary in this job. Um, yeah, I made it. <laughs> um, before I get into my remarks, I just want to give you a snapshot of Colorado's new American population. Population. So 9.6% of Colorado's population are immigrants. I'm going to just look at my notes here to make sure I get this right. The top countries of nationality of Colorado's immigrants are Mexico, India, Korea, El Salvador, and China. This data is from 2021, by the way. 83% of the foreign-born population in Colorado is between the ages of 16 to 64, a good working age. 33% of Colorado's immigrants have a higher education, a bachelor's degree at 19%, and approximately 14% have a graduate or professional degree. And one in nine workers in Colorado is an immigrant. And finally, in terms of taxes, $5.9 billion in taxes per year are paid by Colorado's immigrants, including $1.9 billion in state and local taxes. So with that backdrop, what is the Office of New Americans, or ONA? ONA was established uh, in June of 2021 by the state legislature passed House Bill 211150. Governor Polis signed it into law. And our vision is that all New Americans have equitable access to opportunity and well-being. And our mission is to facilitate the integration and inclusion of Colorado's New Americans into economic, civic, and social life. And when I talk about New Americans, the law defines them as immigrants, refugees, and their children, just so we're on the same page. So since I was hired, we stood up the office. Uh, we launched the inaugural state integration plan, which is a plan to see how we can meet our mission of integrating and including Colorado's New Americans into Colorado communities. We've held listening tours across the state because as the Office of New Americans, we don't want to be ONA for the Denver metro area. We want to make sure we're ONA for the whole state. And we've started developing rural partnerships. In terms of a workforce lens or a business angle, um, here's what we've done. We've launched the Global Talent Task Force, which is a task force to identify five in-demand occupations to ensure that obstacles and barriers getting into those professions by internationally trained professionals are reduced. That report is coming out at the end of this year, so please be on the lookout for it. We launched the International Medical Graduate Program, which is going to help internationally trained medical doctors get into Colorado's healthcare workforce. 
We've launched the Virtual Career Aligned ESL program, which offers career and sector specific ESL to help employers expand their talent pool and to also help new Americans upskill. By the way, this program is free, so if any employers <laughs> want to take advantage of it, I'll be sure to um, have send over the information to Debbie to get out to, to the group. We launched a webinar series called Working with New Americans from Recruiting to Upskilling, coaching employers on how to engage new American talent from recruiting to upskilling. And finally, we're about to launch the Benefit Recovery Fund, which is gonna be first of its kind in the country, an unemployment program for eligible undocumented individuals. Um, and hopefully it'll be a little bridge of cash assistance until they're able to find their next job. So another major area of work that we have done this past year is uh, we have had a historic migrant influx, if you didn't know that. <laughs> if you haven't watched the news or the radio or anything recently, that's what, that's what we've been doing. Um, and just so you know, immigration is a normal everyday occurrence in Colorado. It's happened for decades. My family immigrated here. You know, and normally what happens is when folks immigrate, they have a family, friends who welcome them, who help them get on their feet, or they go through the traditional resettlement process, which has been in place since 1980, where federally funded resettlement agencies welcome a family, have a home for them, get them employment, get them trained. But the, the thing that was different about this historic migrant influx is the folks who mainly were coming had no family, had no friends, and weren't coming through a, a formal process. And so our partners at, at Denver, who've been amazing, incredible partners in this work, stood up emergency shelters right away um, in just a year ago. Um, and I want to tell you how the state has been involved. Um, and initially, a lot of these folks were just passing through. They had other intended destinations. But after a while, um, I think because of the good treatment, everybody wanted to stay. Um, and so Colorado has invested over $19 million this past year. As you know, we have Tabor, so we can't spend what we haven't budgeted, so we were able to redirect this funding towards the effort. Um, we've spent our money in two main ways. One is to help the city of Denver emergency operations, emergency shelter staff, emergency technical assistance. And the other way is helping stand up small community-based organizations that can help serve those folks who wanna call Colorado home to help them get out of emergency shelters and into more permanent housing so they can start building their lives here while they await their immigration proceedings. And we've had great success. Since February 2023 through October of 2023, um, our community-based partners have secured over 730 leases, housing over 2,700 people, including over 1,000 kids. And after the federal announcement of expanded TPS in September of 2023, we came up with a plan. We're like, finally, the federal government expanded TPS for Venezuelans, and most of our new arrivals are Venezuelans. So we came up with a plan to try to identify as many folks as possible who were eligible for this employment authorization and said, we want to identify them, get them employment authorization, and get them jobs. And we floated this plan, and to our great delight, we had a private donation of $500,000 to start this effort. And we got to work. We started standing up immigration legal assistance through clinics and low bono attorneys to try to identify and get as many people employment authorization as possible. Um, with this fund, we are hoping to serve 2,000 folks, and we're also hoping to scale. So if we can get more money into this fund, um, and by the way, this donation was given to the Newcomers Fund hosted by the Rose Community Foundation, who also is a fabulous partner. They've charged us 0% in facilitating the fund. Um, we will be able to serve more people. Um, we're also partnering with the federal government. We're pushing for fee waivers, and every application we submit through this process, we're kind of assuming that they're going to <laughs> waive the fee. Um, we've done that through communication with them. They have approved a nonprofit letter that um, 
nonprofits can sign affirming that the person that is coming to the clinic is indigent and doesn't have money for the $545 fee that it costs for TPS and employment authorization or $495 just for the employment authorization. And we're also working that with them to expedite processing of these applications because we know typically employment authorization is takes six and a half to seven months or longer to receive. So the employment part of the, the plan is to ensure that our newest arrivals get placed into jobs that are more commensurate with their talents, skills, and experience. I just heard the other day of an Afghan judge working at Krispy Kreme, and you can only imagine <laughs> what talent we're, we're, we're not putting to use there. I mean, a judge, um, and I, I love her humility to be able to work at Krispy Kreme. Um, I want her to stop working at Krispy Kreme. I want her to get a better job. 100% glad we're all on the same page. <laughs> so Ona also has a dotted line to the governor's policy office. And so over the past year, we've done a lot of advocacy with the White House, the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, and thankfully, finally, we got the expanded TPS. We're still pushing for blanket fee waivers and other things. Um, the governor's office, uh, Governor Polis is also the vice chair of the National Governors Association right now, and there have been three committees historically in the NGA, and this year there's a committee on immigration where there are 12 governors, Democratic, Democratic and Republican, six each, where they're trying to coalesce around principles um, for immigration reform. And this, hopefully, once we get a core group of people that can coalesce around principles, and they mainly have to do with workforce, because that's where I think both parties can see eye to eye, um, we can get them published and hopefully give cover to Congress and kind of give them a push as well to like, come on, we gotta, we gotta get some things done. So that's what's happening there. Immigrant, immigration and immigrant integration is critical, not only to our national economy, but to Colorado's economy and success. Um, nationally, over the last decade, the U.S. has had a total decline. There's my 10 minutes going off, so I'm going to wrap up, Debbie. <laughs> so um, suffice it to say that Colorado is really being impacted. Um, we have, we're the fourth fastest aging state in the country. We have an absolute decline in the forecast for folks under age 18. Without net immigration through 2030, we project to have deficits in age groups from zero to 44. And we already have two job openings for every unemployed person. Um, and so without immigration reform or integration or increased immigration, we will falter in terms of competition, economy, innovation, national security, and diversity, which makes us a richer and more wonderful place to live. And I have bullets under all of that, so I can maybe send some studies and stuff to Debbie to, to get out to you if you guys want more um, resources. So what can you guys do? You can do three things. One, you can give to the Newcomers Fund. Um, if you tag your donation with Employment Fund, that will go to the legal assistance piece to get folks employment authorization as quickly as possible. Two, you can hire our newest Coloradans. They are so great. They are wanting to work. They have so much talent. Um, and if you only have low-skilled opportunities, you can try to create pathways that they can start at a low-skill opportunity but make their way up. Anthony Cherwinski, Anthony, can you flag your hand? He is on our, our team right here, Global Talent Advisor, working on all things employment integration. Please touch base with him if you're interested in hiring new arrivals or anything employment integration. Finally, you can press for change. You can have Congress take action. If they're not going to do comprehensive reform, fine. Do specific reform and start making changes so that we can have an immigration system that works for our state. Thank you so much. I'm not texting. These are my notes for today. Um, so good morning again, everyone. My name is Atim O.T. Uh, and I am here on behalf of Mayor Mike Johnston, um, who sends his regards. We are super busy, um, as Dee and everyone in the state is as well, on the issue of our newly arrived residents. 
Um, so I'm here, um, again, my office is the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs within the Agency for Human Rights and Community Partnerships. Just a little bit about my office. So we try to partner with nonprofits, community-based organizations, federal, state, and local agencies alike to really develop and implement policies, practices, as well as programs that can positively influence paths to immigrant integration. As Dee mentioned, um, my office uh, and uh, um, several other agencies across the city have been actively working to support our newly arrived uh, through our humanitarian response. We have, you know, we are committed to welcoming um, as many uh, migrants and asylum seekers as we can potentially handle. Um, to date, we are inching very close to over 30,000 migrants and asylum seekers that we've welcomed into the city and county of Denver. As Dee mentioned, some are leaving, but others are staying. And those that are staying, we are really working hard with our nonprofit partners as well as agencies to figure out what are ways and solutions to help folks have positive pathways towards on their integration journey. And as Dee again mentioned, there's, you know, historically immigrant integration and uh, migration um, into cities and states has been successful, but there have been challenges. Um, and most recently, our mayor went to Washington, D.C. Uh, with some other mayors from um, the cities of New York, Chicago, Houston, and Los Angeles. And really, it was a call to the federal government, to the White House, congressional delegations, to help us with funding. Um, as Dee talked about, uh, budgets have been impacted. Our municipal budgets are strained. We've spent over $32 million, almost $33 million, in supporting this effort. That unfortunately comes at a cost where we're also then pulling back on city services that we all need. Um, and it's not sustainable. Um, we also, as Dee mentioned, we want to accelerate work authorization. We have folks who, when they get here, they want to work. We also have employers who need people to work in their, in their businesses. And so there's, uh, one would seem an opportunity that we really need to harness. And yes, there's challenges around that opportunity, but that's why we're advocating at that federal level. And then we just want stronger coordination. I think one of the challenges that we continue to face is not having an, a, a certain understanding of how many people, when folks are coming um, in the middle of the night or during the day. So that, that, that has proven to be quite a challenge. While all that is going on at the federal level, and we'll continue to do that, Mayor Johnson is committed to doing that, um, and I think our governor continues to, to be committed, we still have work to do on the local level because we still have folks that are coming here on a daily basis. And so this is where all of you in your industries, in your innovative ways of thinking about how can we, I'm gonna call it a reignition, um, but thinking innovatively about how can we start working on um, skilling folks to meet the industry needs of today. Uh, we've got workforce development in our, in our city that will be doing some of that. And thanks to state legislation and some of the, the um, opportunities that ONA is doing at the state, we're gonna be able to push some of those opportunities. Um, but those partnerships with all of you and your industries are key. Um, we are gonna be exploring, you know, what are some other creative pathways to work um, that don't uh, require uh, federal, federal authorization. How can we support our immigrant um, community today is something that um, our, our mayor, our city, and really all of us, uh, we want to hopefully through this discussion um, start brainstorming and, and putting some things into action. So with that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to, you know, be a part of this discussion. Um, I don't have a, a, a general name, so a team OT is my name. You can Google me, um, and my email will come up if you have questions or if you have thoughts, if you want to talk any more about what the city is doing or how you might be a part of the city, please do so. I will also just say, um, we will be hosting an actual work, uh, a, a job fair on Friday at the web building for bilingual staff. I don't know if you all have read that in the news over the last couple of hours, 
um, but that is something that um, we are we are um, eagerly seeking. So again, we are hoping as a city, but I would say honestly as 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 a state, um, to have everyone wherever you are, it doesn't matter if you're in Denver or another locality, um, to really think through what are some ways that you and the industries that you work in or the businesses that you engage with um, can connect to not only our current arriving residents, but also long-term residents who, who want the opportunity to um, be successful in their integration pathway. So on behalf of the city and county of Denver, thank you all for your time and we look forward to the discussion today. Thank you, and we'll be sure to provide um, information to all of you as well, links and um, email addresses as appropriate, so you can have that. So I wanna welcome our panel. If you all wanna start making your way up, um, we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion to follow up on some of the framing remarks. You can sit anywhere but that chair. That's my chair. And then, uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> he was looking at my chair. I'm like, no, I can't sit there. Um, excited to welcome all of them. Um, first, Kit Tainter is the Vice President of Policy and Practice at Welcome US. She's a seasoned leader in refugee and immigrant integration with a strategic focus at both national and state levels. She is the former senior advisor for new American integration in the Colorado governor's office and president of state coordinators of settlement. So welcome Kit to you. Uh, next is Brock Herzberg. Uh, he's the principal owner of Capital Focus LLC, a governmental affairs professional with a background in political advocacy. Uh, Brock has been working on this issue for at least a decade and a half, maybe longer than that. But uh, Brock and I coordinate often um, through the work he does with other coalitions of business leaders on this issue. Um, Alexander Padilla, um, welcome. This is your home turf. Uh, he is a professor of economics, the department chair, and the director of the Exploring Economic Freedom Project at MSU Denver, where he's been teaching economics since 2012. So welcome, Alex. 2002. 2002? Oh, got my number. Thank you for correcting me. And then last, we've got Robert Barnes, a senior consultant in strategic workforce planning at Excel Energy. He's a dedicated professional with a background as a proud veteran of the United States Air Force and Army Reserve. Thank you for your service. And he's also focused on aligning workforce capabilities with the dynamic changing needs of the energy sector and bringing positive change within that industry. So Robert is helping to represent the private sector today. So let's welcome all the panelists. So we've got a limited amount of time. So the way we're gonna sort of think about the conversation today is in two, two different segments. Um, first, we're gonna try to understand the problem a little bit better. And I have some questions along those lines. And then we're gonna talk about solutions. So it always is nice to end with what, what can we do? So when we think about the problem, I think we are talking about, uh, you know, when we talk about modernizing immigration, it is modernizing our legal immigration system. Uh, and there's lots of interesting dynamic with, uh, you know, of course it's a federal issue and um, seems like both political parties, you know, can't seem to come together and resolve. But how, um, I'll, I'd love to start with you maybe Brock first, just how would you define the problem in kind of a big picture standpoint? Uh, sure. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so I, I think the, our previous speakers have nailed it. I think you've talked about it. Um, part of the problem is um, we're operating under a very old system um, in a very modern world that a lot of other countries are catching up. And, and to Dee's point, seeing that immigration is a key solution to continuing to modernize and, and, and innovate. And I think what we're facing is not, um, not having a system that's keeping up with uh, the demands and needs, not just of this country and the citizens here and the businesses here, but also the global environment that we live in. We, we no longer live in an isolationist type of um, community. Um, what happens here impacts people across the world and what happens across the world, which I think um, we just uh, heard highlighted, clearly impacts us here. And I think our system is just not keeping up with that. And for me and, and the business community um, and the people that I represent, I think that's part of the, the biggest problem that I hear from coalition businesses is a modernizing world and country 
operating in a system that's 50 years past when it should have been modernized. So that's part of how I would start with it, Debbie. And uh, Professor Padilla, do you want to give some context from your perspective on the immigration issue and perhaps from kind of that economics standpoint as well? Um, so I'm going to give a big picture is that um, the basic answer is that the system is not designed to attract workers. It's never been designed to attract workers. If anything, the system has been designed to prevent and make very difficult for business to hire workers to help make their business more profitable and serve better consumers. The second part of the question, and it's <coughs> politics, right? And I'm sure there are some policymakers in the room, so I don't want to be too offensive, <laughs> even though, given my French accent, it's already too late for that. <laughs> uh, it's it just that most voters and most people that, that vote are not well informed. And part of that is our fault as academic economists to communicate in plain English, no pun intended here, uh, and clear manner what the research shows. And policymakers and politicians, they're trying to get elected and they exploit, they literally exploit people's belief, personal biases and personal stereotypes about foreign workers. And that leads to the entire system, what we have now, which is not working. And it's penalizing businesses, is hurting innovation, is hurting uh, women in general, talented women, is out in many, many sectors. I want to be speaking to them. <laughs> and, and Kit, I want to turn it over to you. This is not a new issue for you in terms of immigration generally. Um, and then also, I think we were talking before we started today about there's another level here now, a new layer with the migrant crisis. And, um, you know, rightfully so. We do some work with the Business Roundtable out of D.C. too. There is concern about you know, we are a nation of laws. Uh, you know, border security, especially in a time of geopolitical conflict, uh, brings, I think, uh, people some angst. How do, you, how do you sort of put context to that new layer um, with, with kind of the current still need to find solutions? But there are a lot of complexities to this issue. Yeah, it's extremely complex. I mean, Brock sort of hit the nail on the head. Like, we are operating in a system that's 50 years old. It's not agile enough to um, respond to the demands. You know, I think there there is this narrative, and you talked about it a little bit, there's a narrative in the public that, you know, people just need to come the right way. And there is no right way for the majority of people that are seeking safety and refuge in the United States. There is no line to get in. Um, and so that, you know, that sort of noise and rhetoric in our system, I think, is very harmful. Um, you know, right now we have an asylum system that is trying, that is really strained because it's trying to meet the needs of all newcomers um, to our nation when it's not set up to do that. And so what we're seeing um, at the, what we're seeing here at the local level is migrants coming without work authorization, without sort of the support systems, the infrastructure, the regional co collaboration that we need in order to really harness the skill sets of newcomers. You know, I will say that there has been some innovation underneath the Biden administration. I know we're not trying to talk about solutions, but I don't like to talk about the problems in the same sentence without you know, also saying that there are opportunities that do exist and the Biden administration has applied a number of innovations including by, you know, there's an app at the border called CPP1. Um, if you make an appointment there and you come through that process, you are granted humanitarian parole and that does allow you access to work authorization. So it's these small incremental changes that the administration is making underneath its um, existing authority which creates some solutions, but also make sort of the challenges even more complex. How do you know if someone you're working with has come through a certain system or a certain program and has certain access to benefits? So it's a very diverse and complex system, and it's been, been even more complex because we're trying to you know, take little small things and make changes here and there, where at the end of the day, we need wholesale solutions to really drive the sort of change that our economy needs. And Robert, to bring you in, I think it was, it was talked about uh, you know, the influx specifically even just the last six months that, uh, you know, resources are being taken from other areas in the, in the city and the state to uh, make sure that we have resources for the new folks coming to Colorado. But yet the sustainability of that is if they would find a, a job um, opportunity perhaps that, that is much more sustainable than our nonprofit community and government can fulfill. 
Um, with Excel, you have big goals for workforce, and you represent a company too. Many of our companies say workforce attraction and retention is our number one issue. So how do you look at all the big goals you have as a, as a big employer here in Colorado, um, and how does this issue perhaps come into play? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, first and foremost, uh, you, for those of you that don't know, um, in terms of big goals, uh, Excel's made a commitment to be 80% carbon-free in their energy production by 2030 and 100% carbon-free by 2050. So those are pretty substantial goals. And with that comes um, some pretty substantial challenges as far as our workforce goes. And that's exactly where I work. So uh, I focus, um, I'm in our strategic workforce planning department, and we focus on um, the Just Transition Initiative across Colorado. So Renice Walker is here today, and I work with her from time to time, and um, with the state as well. Um, so uh, if anyone saw there was going to be someone from Excel here today and you had a question about your bill, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I cannot help you with that, and it almost always happens. So uh, wrong guy, wrong time. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as our challenges go, um, you know, we really are going to be focusing on our existing workforce uh, in transitioning. Uh, those folks from our biofuel production, so coal, gas generation that may be closing across all of our service territories and transitioning within, within the company. Um, also, once that happens, we would then need to have a sustainable talent pipeline in these locations. These locations are, you know, for, I live in Broomfield. There's not a power plant in Broomfield. Right, we can almost always guess and assume uh, where these power plants are going to be, and these power plants are largely located in loca rural locations that are highly populated by migrants. Um, my job is to find solutions to these problems. Right, so I've been sitting here for the last you know 30, 40 minutes, and the wheels have just been turning. So what I originally wanted to say is not actually what I'm going to say because I'm learning a lot while just being here, and all solutions are on the table, and that's really where this factors in. Um, but we need to transition our existing workforce first. Then we need to develop a long-term and sustainable talent pipeline in these locations that are incredibly difficult to hire for sometimes, especially our line workers in rural areas. Um, the, the reality is, is that in a modern integration system, immigration system would absolutely help our problem. And uh, I, I think that um, it, it obviously would help the uh, immigrants looking for work. Um, there are training programs through Excel, through the state, through the union. Um, you know, most of our workers in these highly skilled trade jobs uh, make an incredible living, actually. Um, and all the job, all the skill development happens on the job. So um, I hope that answered the question. It totally did. I think okay. the key thing you said to me, which is interesting, is you've already learned a lot in the last yes. even just 30 minutes from people who gave some framing. And I know there's other private sector employers in the room who are probably thinking the same thing. Like, how do I understand this issue better, find resources, find the right connection? And so I think that's a huge win. So thanks for that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, now let's move into, I know we talked about solutions is always really where to go, but we, but we understand we can talk about the complexity of this problem for hours. Um, when we think about solutions and Brock, I think I'm going to start with you because we both really focus on sort of a business coalition of trying to understand, you know, you've spent a lot of years representing dairy farmers, for example. Um, when we think about solutions, um, we think about federal and statewide immigration policies that are modernized, market-based, predictable, and sustainable. And for all the same reasons that were already discussed, there's so many reasons why that would make sense. But sort of a market-based, predictable system would be so helpful. Give us a sense of what solutions you're working on through the organization you represent. And maybe throw in a, an example from um, rural Colorado yeah. as well. Uh, sure. And I, I think that's a great question. And I do think, Debbie, just to, as an aside on that, um, a lot of stuff is happening at the state level now because of the inaction at the federal level. And I think that's a great way to show our congressional delegation, let's push up on you to, to have some uh, movement at the, the federal level. And our state has been, I think Colorado has been great um, to do that. Some, I mean, some of the broad things that I think we need to work on, um, you know, visa reform, those caps are, are very, very um, important. Um, the asylum 
process is just abhorrent in this country. Um, and you know, your average waiting um, Immig American Immigration Council will say it's almost four years, four and a half years to go through that process. We need to look at that. But there are some state-based and local issue um, that we can uh, try and address some of these issues. One of the things that I've worked on and this has been a decade ago, and it was on behalf of some folks in rural Colorado with law enforcement. We found in rural areas, and I think you mentioned this, um, there were a lot of workers out there, whether it was on ag operations or just um, companies who had maybe data centers out there, that a lot of their employees um, were immigrants, migrants, refugees that were coming in, we heard a clear message coming from law enforcement saying, we are scaring people um, if they're driving from their job to home um, or vice versa or doing some something for their work. Um, there is this hesitancy when we pull over somebody, maybe even for a broken tail light, that there is a very much a barrier between us. So what we did at the state level, and this is a, the Capitol can be um, here and in DC, can be a very effective tool. Um, and it, they do pass a lot of uh, very relevant, helpful laws. One of the things that we did starting in 2013, it came to fruition, I think in either 14 or 15, um, was work on a driver's license program through the Department of Transportation in order for people, regardless of status, um, immigration status, to be able to attain documentation that shows, I have gone through a program to be able to drive on your roads, um, that there should be no barrier between law enforcement um, and that person. That program is still not only in place, um, we have now worked with the General Assembly, both Republican and Democrat. These are, this was started when Republicans still had control of one chamber, and we've expanded it under full Democrat with Republican support um, in order to get this program out to all of our DMVs in order that people in Fort Morgan don't have to drive to Grand Junction in order to access this documentation. So I do think that that, and that's just a small example. I think there are many others, especially in, in the rural parts of the state, because you do have to have a different approach. And to Dee's um, uh, point of not just an ONA for the metro area, these are problems that I think get exacerbated in rural Colorado, where there's not that loud voice of six million people around you. Um, but there are issues, and I think we just have to take them somewhat one at a time, piecemeal them, and approach them as this is a, an issue we can address um, without this overarching, when people say immigration reform, let's go at it and see what can we fix here, what can we do piecemeal at a higher level, but there are things that we can be doing. Okay. Kit, just as a kind of a follow-up on that, if you could give everyone a little bit more information about um, how does it work for temporary protected status and also the temporary workforce authorizations. I think those are interesting ways, there are legal ways for folks to have the ability to work, where employers would feel a comfort level that they're uh, able to hire. And as we said, a lot of times people that could be here four, five, six years in the legal system, mm -hmm. how do we uh, give them that authorization to work while they're sorting out um, the, their legal, the legal system? If you could give an update on that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is where you know our immigration lawyers and everybody, everyone will say this is really complicated, right? Um, but you know what, what we said before is like we want comprehensive immigration reform, or at least a modernization of the system, even if it's not comprehensive. That has to happen at the congressional level. But there are a number of tools that the executive branch at the federal level does have. Two of them are temporary protected status and humanitarian parole. So. When you hear the word temporary protected status, it, it just means that the status is temporary. Um, there are Salvadorans, and Dee mentioned how many Salvadorans we have in the state. There are Salvadorans who have been on temporary protected status in Colorado since the 1990s. So these are people who own houses, who have children here. Their status is still temporary, although I would call them full and complete members of our Colorado community, you know, own houses in, in Roaring Fork Valley and places like that. So temporary protected status is something that the administration can use. It does provide, um, it does provide relief from deportation, and then it also provides access to work authorization. So both good things um, in terms of inclusion in our Colorado community. You feel safe 
driving around our roads that you're not going to all of a sudden be caught in detention and not be able to pick your kids up for school. And then you also are able to work in our local economies. The Biden administration has really been using humanitarian parole over the last couple of months and years as another tool underneath the executive branch that offers the same thing, relief from deportation as well as access to work authorization. So um, remember when the Afghans um, came two years ago, which seems like three crises um, in the past somehow, um, and it was very recent, they came under humanitarian parole. So did um, people from who were fleeing Ukraine underneath Uniting for Ukraine. So same thing there. We're trying to use these sort of piecemeal temporary statuses to help answer some of our workforce solutions and to give people a place of refuge and an ability to rebuild their lives. But they're temporary, Debbie. So they don't offer any sort of um, path to citizenship without tapping into our asylum system. So it's just a really good example of something that we've done that works, but it's a Band-Aid on the larger issues. And oftentimes, you know, when you've got a Band-Aid, you keep on having to, to buy those resources again and, and again and again versus solving it over the long term. Makes sense. Um, Professor Padilla, to you, um, what are, are there some successful immigration systems out there? Whoop, I just, okay. Okay. Cue, cue the <laughs> mic, yeah. <laughs> uh, any, anything that you could draw our attention to from sort of an academic perspective that would be a good example as we're looking to sort of um, use our voice to see about how to modernize sure. our system? Uh, sure. Um, so if we look at around the world uh, and we want to look at countries that have a larger share of foreign-born workers who are uh, foreign-born citizens, the most of those countries are small countries. They also tend to be not democracies. So for example, United, United Arab Emirates, 88% of their population is foreign-born, right? So you don't become a citizen, but you work there, right? But no, no, and most of those countries are in the Middle East. But if we want to talk more about countries that kind of look like the US, like Canada, for example, uh, they, have a, they have systems, the point system is the one that is the most famous one when we think about Canada, where people apply to come to the Canada and they, and they are scored on a different point system. And uh, they have also provinces, so that will be relate to uh, the state level where provinces can apply to bring immigrants to face a shortage. But Canada is very, very smart right now. They are just passing a policy that gives permanent residency cards to all H-1B workers in the U.S. Which means if you're an H-1B worker in the U.S., Canada welcomes you. Right? So which means you have a lot of high-skilled workers that come to the US, have to go through that, I call it the shining maze, like the movie, where you can, <laughs> you can die frozen because it takes you so much time to go through the immigration maze system, where you, you come to the US. Remember, the H-1B is not a permanent residency. It's a three years visa that you can renew another three years. And if you come from a country like, let's say, India or Mexico, and you are highly skilled, it's going to take you forever, literally forever, to get to permanent residency. Canada is like saying, come on in. We will welcome you. It's going to be much easier. So what's happening here is that if we want to look at a successful system, I think we have to look at Canada, Australia, New Zealand that have point system where you can, uh, based on your skills, go faster through the process. A follow up on that, because I have interviewed some Canadians about their system. It's my understanding that they don't have the same sense of um, numbers for each a country, but they really sort of pick and choose based on what types of, you know, if they want high tech cybersecurity expertise from this one country, they just do that. They're not, they don't feel compelled to have a broad approach. Is that your understanding, Professor? My understanding, it's like, it's really, we don't have a quota system that we have, right? So you have, they look at where are the most skills people that we are looking for. So if you have a lot of, I'm not trying to point just India, but if, a lot of Indian that are, you know, have PhD in physics or medicine or are doctors or engineers, 
Well, they are going to try to recruit those immigrants, those workers from India, without having concern about how many Indians are going to move to Canada. That's my understanding. Yeah, that's my understanding too. Um, we've got time for just some really some closing remarks from the panel. The time went really fast. And like I said, we're going to put out some additional resources for the business roundtable. This isn't our first conversation. It won't be our last on this issue. And we definitely want to be a resource, uh, particularly to connect you with some of the solutions from the offices we've heard from today. So look, look for that and look for more opportunities to be engaged. But as we kind of wrap up, um, I want to kind of also go to kind of solution oriented, but also back to kind of the why. Why does it matter? and want to get some additional feedback. Um, Robert, we'll start with you. Why would this issue matter to an Excel Energy? Again, you you represent really a broad-based view of business on why it might might matter from that, and then we'll kind of go down the panel. Yeah, the, uh, the quick answer is it's mutually beneficial. Um, it's beneficial for the individual being hired, and it's beneficial for the company. Um, you know, something I forgot to mention earlier that's one of you know, an increasingly big challenge for us is when we think about moving away from biofuel um, energy and we're moving into this new frontier of clean and renewable energy, we don't know what that looks like yet. Um, we, we, we have wind on the system, we have solar on the system, um, and there's a couple other types of different energy production that are clean and renewable on different systems across the country. However, um, a lot of what you'll see come on 2030 and beyond hasn't even been developed yet. And so when you're thinking about workforce development, when you're thinking about the folks that have the skills to do these jobs, there really isn't anyone out there yet. Um, but we know that there is a highly skilled workforce outside of this country. We know that there are other countries outside of the US that are much further along in their energy production innovation. So we can just assume that those skills exist. So it's a mutually beneficial um, thing for the company, for the worker. Um, so, uh, you know, as we move into this new frontier, I always say, um, we really need to keep all solutions on the table. And uh, this is definitely one of those solutions moving forward. Um, yeah, and thank you, Debbie, for, for hosting this. This is such a, a big conversation. We could have this as a, a month-long event and still not cover everything. Um, so, But thank you for bringing us together. Um, one of the things, just a couple things, and one I won't have time to, but I think you highlighted it at the beginning of why. A lot of times, especially as a business community, and I'm so fortunate to represent the business community, they are very good people who want to find solutions um, for their communities and for their businesses, for their families, for their employees. And I think sometimes in this conversation, we lose the humanitarian aspect of the very conversation that we're having. But again, that's a five hour conversation. One of the things that I would say that really stands out to me is why. Um, and the American Immigration Council put out a great blog on this. And it was just the conversation that you and Pro Professor Padilla was having. This country, and I would be remiss to say it, we have some of the best, if not the best in the world, higher education institutions on the planet. We're setting in one right now um, that's a, a, a part of the pillar of the higher ed system in Colorado, in the Rocky Mountain West. This country, um, we have leaps and bounds to go with education, but our higher education system is phenomenal. We have people coming into this country to be educated and then other countries looking at them and saying it's taking too long for them to come out of one of the pillars of institutions, we're going to cherry pick them. And us as a country, we're losing that innovation, uh, that future thought process that is generated um, in hubs like that. And I, I really think there's so many reasons why, but when we have some of the best education institutions on the planet and we're educating people and then losing them because of a system that cannot handle them, I, I just think that alone for me is, why would we educate them and then send them somewhere else because we can't get them through a, a, a system here. So I, it, to me, it, and I, I think that's part of the business conversation, it's part of it as a whole, but that to me stands out as a glaring, glaring example. Yeah, thank you, Brock. Kit? 
Yeah, I think we spent um, a good amount of time talking about, you know, federal immigration policy. And so I always like to remind people that, you know, immigration policy is the purview of the federal mm -hmm. government, but immigrant inclusion, integration, and belonging is very much a local issue. And so when we talk about a local issue, yes, it's the state, yes, it's the city, but yes, it's also the business community. So how we harness skills, how we support people um, that have come to our country as immigrants is very much something that we do collectively together. Um, so I think you said the A, B, C, G, or something of the business yeah. roundtable. Like, how does everybody step forward? Um, how do we make sure that people have access to jobs that can, um, that you know, can help them provide for their families so they're no longer in shelters? How can we make sure the harness the skills that that people have so we can drive our economy forward? So one of those things is like this is this is a hard problem. This is a challenging problem, and it's also a problem that we all have a place to to help solve. There's a, a place for everyone us in, in this room to figure out how do we sort of chip away at this very large iceberg and begin to make real change. Um, you know, Dee mentioned that, you know, migrants are choosing to come to Colorado, and that is true. And the reason that they're, they're choosing to come here is because of our welcoming community, but it's also because they are hooking into business opportunities. They are being able to apply their skills and really rebuild their lives and their dignity um, here in our state. And we should be proud to be a state that's able to harness them and then challenge ourselves to be able to do more in the future. So the short answer to that very difficult question is that, first of all, immigration is a human question. We are not talking about goods and services like in international trade, we're talking about human being. So it's complex, so we have to use empathy for the immigrants, empathy for the people that have concern about immigration, but ultimately the short answer is this. US is one of the greatest, if not the greatest country in the world because of immigrants. Immigrants have helped US to become a better country and have helped natives to have longer life expectancy, higher living standards. You know, all the good things that we enjoy in America are due to that collaboration between immigrants and US native, people that have been here for decades and centuries. And therefore, we have to think in the long run about whether or not we want to keep that path for continuous growth and having high li higher living standard, higher quality of life, longer life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's thank our panel. Thanks, everyone. We did, we only got to about 20% of the questions we planned for. So I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like that was, it was just so fascinating and just not enough time, as we said, to cover it all. I want to just say, um, be on the lookout for some of the work that we're doing. We put together a toolkit with, along with Brock's um, organization to help especially employers understand this issue. What are the top five issues? We had some handouts out front. We're getting ready to update that with new numbers. So we've got some of that on our website. Happy to be a resource for you. And then we're hoping to also be a portal for connecting uh, our employers with folks who need employment. And I know we're still sorting out some of those um, legalities to make sure that the employers, of course, feel comfortable with, with the legal system, but making sure that we can be a portal on that as well. So look for that as soon as that's ready to go. And then last, I just want to thank everyone. Um, this is an issue we certainly bring up when we meet with our members of Congress every year as a, as a business community. And as has been mentioned many times today, we all have a voice. It's, it is a federal issue at the heart, but as a state, we're doing a lot of really powerful work. This is an area where we've coordinated as well with Governor Polis on ways where we can be creative and use our voice as um, to try to have some solutions here in Colorado. And frankly, I think Colorado is kind of leading the state, uh, leading the country, excuse me, on some of that um, powerful work that's now happening with the governors. So we're excited to keep you informed on this important issue. And this is this will be the uh, this won't be the last conversation from Colorado Business Roundtable. So thanks everybody for joining us. There might be some other hot coffee out in the in the lobby as well. Thank you. Thanks,